Welcome back to the Homestyle MMA Podcast. Sean Van Buren here for episode 19. Shout out to all the listeners or homies checking this out right now. I appreciate all of you. Today we're recapping UFC Fight Night Sandhagen vs. Song. Because there are no fights this upcoming Saturday weekend, we will be playing matchmaker and discussing some fights to make in each division through the 145 pound divisions in this episode. Next week we'll finish out the remaining weight classes. Let's start with UFC Fight Night Sandhagen vs. Song in the rapid recap. UFC Fight Night Sandhagen vs. Song, Blood and Cuts. That is what defined this night, some nasty cuts in the main event mixed with some fight duds that didn't really pan out for excitement, so let's dive into the rapid recap and explain kind of where the fights were great and where the fights were kind of a letdown. We're going to start off by noting that Aspen Ladd vs. Sarah McMahon was canceled because Aspen Ladd missed weight. This was her third weight miss in the UFC. And frankly, the UFC is going to be really not happy about it. We'll see what the fallout is there with the company. I don't know if they're going to keep her on the roster or force her up to 145, where unfortunately I think she's going to be really small for the 145 division. We'll see what happens, but we started off the prelims with Nicholas Mota versus Cameron Van Camp to start off the night. Van Camp looked every bit of his height and reach advantages to start this fight. Super tall, nice long, lightweight. But the announcers touched on it very quickly in round one, and we could see it sitting from home on our couches. It was very noticeable that Van Camp would leave his chin way up high when he would be slipping strikes. He'd move his shoulders, but his head wouldn't necessarily move from the center line, and his chin would tilt up. Not a good habit to have for long-term success in MMA. And it did ultimately lead to his end because Mota found his left hand clean to the chin, with a 2-3 combo with a flush strike from the left for the first round knockout. Next came Tony Gravely versus Jared Basharat. Gravely looked sharp on the feet, which is a really nice sign for us because I thought Javid would have the advantage on the feet. And then he went into grappling and wrestling in round one, which I loved because I said last week that wrestling was his key to victory in this fight. Unfortunately, That success didn't last that long. Basharat finished the round with some nice kickboxing, which we already knew he had in his bag. And this fight was generally exactly how I told you last week that it would go. Gravely was the better wrestler, but Basharat was better on the feet and with his submission ability during scrambles to gain advantages. Basharat crushed the body all fight long with these extremely heavy and fast leg kicks, and Gravely just couldn't wrestle efficiently long enough in this one. Which is a little bit shocking for me. I didn't know he had some gas tank problems. But Basharat grinded his way to a decision with excellent kickboxing. I said last week that this would be a decision fight. And we should have gone that way instead of going gravelly money line. Maria Agapova versus Jillian Robertson. These fighter strategies went exactly as I told you last week. Jillian Robertson worked very hard right away to get this fight down to the ground. And I said Maria did not want to go there with Robertson. Maria Agapova had excellent strikes during the grappling exchanges, which was her clearest path to victory. Striking was her way to win this fight. It was exactly as I said last week. Whichever fighter could impose their will and get this fight where they wanted it to take place would win. Agapova dominated with her striking, but Jillian Robertson was relentless with her wrestling and submission attempts, and eventually she grinded Agapova down, got the rear naked choke submission win in round two, and her wrestling was simply too much for Agapova. Frankly, too, Agapova just needs to work on her wrestling and jiu-jitsu. She just made too many mistakes while trying to defend submissions. Trey Ogden versus Daniel Zellhuber was the highly anticipated debut of Zellhuber. This fight started off super slow. This is one of the first ones that started off, and I was like, okay, guys, we are in a fight. Let's start seeing some action. I think Zellhuber... He was supposed to be the better striker, but he was not the best on the ground, and I think he was too afraid of being taken down. I told you last week that I thought Ogden would win on the ground and Zell Huber on the feet, but what was interesting is Zell Huber was so afraid of getting taken down, he was hesitant to strike, which actually made Ogden much better on the feet as well. Ogden had more volume, Zell Huber was a little bit gun shy, and he really had a poor showing as a favorite heading into this fight. Daniel Zellhuber never turned it up, 
because he had fear throughout this whole fight of being taken down, never went all out in round three when he knew he was losing, and Trey Ogden frankly earned himself that decision victory. He fought smart, he fought consistently, and he fought all three rounds, which is a way you can win, but Zell Huber just never really scared him with anything. Trey Ogden never slowed down with his striking and used takedown feints late in the fight to make his striking even more effective, which is a high IQ MMA fighting style. Loma Lukbunmi looked very strong with her punches and kicks early in this fight against Denise Gomez. Heavy, heavy shots. Luma looked very good in round one and even got top position in the back in that round. Gomez showed excellent jiu-jitsu skill on the ground, though, and almost had an arm triangle, followed by an arm bar to end that round. This was very confusing for me. Frankly, Gomez should have finished this fight with the arm triangle. She had it locked in in proper body position. She was on the right side, but she let it go to go for the arm bar. I was very confused, and I just wasn't super impressed with Denise Gomez anywhere that this fight took place compared to Look Boon Me. Look Boon Me seemed stronger on the feet. She seemed stronger on the ground. And the third round was also weird because Gomez went for a heel hook, and it seemed to just kind of freeze Loma. I don't think she knew which way to turn. She was scared. And Denise Gomez was able to use it to get to the back with a lot of time left to try to find the submission. She couldn't. She kept getting these favorable dominant positions, and it's like she couldn't figure out how to finish the submissions. Loma muscled out of it and got the decision win. Trevin Giles versus Luis Koch. Another fight that started off very slow. It was very weird. Koch looked like a shell of himself in the cage. Both fighters were cautious, I think, of the power coming back their way. So they didn't throw that much. It was another slow first round, and it made me worried about our missed bet earlier in the night for fights not good the distance with Trey Ogden versus Zell Huber. When that fight started off super slow, we missed in that fight. And at the end of the first round, this fight had 15 total combined strikes landed. Total strikes. I mean, yawn. Terrible. I could have used the bathroom, had a meal just completely ignored this whole fight because by the time we finished the second round, 38 total strikes had landed. Not significant strikes, just strikes in general. I could not have been more wrong all day long with these prelims. It was honestly impressive. I thought we were in for some bangers, and there were more duds than I really expected. Trevin Giles won in one of the most boring decisions we've had in years, and luckily... The prelims ended with Damon Jackson versus Pat Sabatini. That fight had a lot of anticipation and that fight delivered, to a degree. Damon Jackson landed a big strike to start this fight and stunned Pat Sabatini. He jumped on top, rained down strikes to get a very fast first round knockout. Amazing finish. We learned some unfortunate details surrounding Damon Jackson and his family. He found out uh, two weeks ago now that his younger brother passed away and he got the win in his honor. So our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. That is very upsetting news to receive. He decided to stay on the card and continue with this fight, which is a very high-risk fight for him, and he won in honor of his brother. Absolutely great story. I'm very sorry to hear about the passing of his brother, but I hope he could find a little bit of solace in getting the win on Saturday. That ended the prelims. Unbelievable betting so far. Never in my life have I done so poorly. I lost all seven prelim bets. With one as a going back for more bets, so we were down a staggering eight units. It was so bad that I was impressed with myself. I was laughing. I mean, it's hard to go 0-7. I would almost say it's as hard or harder to go 0-7 compared to 7-0. Most of the fights also... I don't know if this made me feel better or worse, but most of the fights went how I said they could go on last week's episode as far as which fighter could win and how they could win. We just literally picked the wrong side of each one. It was incredible. Go back and listen to last week's episode. You'll hear, you know, I'll say how fighter X could win, how fighter Y could win. I would pick Y and then X would win how I said that he could win. (laughs) But, But hey, with nothing left to lose, the main card began. Marc-Andre Baralt versus Anthony Hernandez. Finally, these two fighters went at it right away. In what was a weird night of fights, these guys wasted no time. Good mix of striking variety as well from both fighters, which got us excited for the main card. 
Anthony Hernandez looked really sharp in all aspects of MMA in round one. I told you last week that Hernandez would win this fight if he got it to the ground, and that he would go for takedowns right away. He was incredibly creative with these takedowns as well. The wrestling looked like it was already getting to the gas tank of Mark andre Barrault in round one. Lots of constant action in this fight, and it's what the fans needed. Hernandez was a cardio machine, which was just so incredibly impressive for a middleweight. Incredible fighting pace, he mixed his striking and his wrestling exceptionally well to keep them both very efficient, and in the third round, Anthony Hernandez got an arm triangle submission to cap off an incredibly impressive well-rounded MMA showing. He also picked up and slammed Baralt on his head in that round, which is just awesome to see. Not a lot of people go for slams because it's hard to get a favorable position after you slam a guy into the ground, but man, when they happen, they are exciting. Following up that fight were the big boys with Tanner Bozier versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Bozier throws very hard with every strike, but Nascimento weighed in around 30 pounds heavier than Bozier, and he looked every bit of those 30 plus pounds on fight night. Rodrigo used takedowns, he used his size to take Bozier down and keep him there at times, and it's just an excellent strategy. And it was where Nascimento wanted this fight to take place. Bozier has a big right hand, and you neutralize that power with wrestling and fighting on the ground. Bozier, I have to give him his props though. I mean, he fought very hard. He fought very hard for positions, even though he was well underweight compared to his opponent. And it was just an impressive showing for Bozier. He threw heavy all fight long. Nascimento got a takedown in round two, jumped on his back, went for a rear naked choke. But Bozier just has no quit in him. He got out of it. I was worried that this fight at this point was going to see the judges. I thought there was no chance these big boys were going to see the judges, but by middle of the second, I thought we were probably in trouble. And with how our night was going, comically going, you could say, of course it did. Decision victory for Rodrigo Nascimento, and that led us to another highly anticipated matchup for newcomers Joe Pfeiffer versus Alex Amadovsky. There was a lot of tension in this fight. Both fighters had a ton of knockout victory experience. And that led us to another not super active start to the fight for this one either. But you could tell that they were at least both looking for bombs. And they landed a few big shots late in round one for each fighter. So while it was a little slow, the tension when they would throw, it had a lot behind it. It still kept us interested at least. And with one minute left, Joe Pfeiffer shut the lights off for Alex Amadovsky. Landed a huge right hand, hit him right on the ear dropped them to the ground, and the fight was over. I told you last week that this fight wouldn't go past one and a half rounds, and thankfully we caught a break, finally, because this was a going back for more two-unit bet for us, and my heart couldn't handle losing another one of those tonight. Veterans Andre Feely versus Bill Algio went at it next. These fighters were just having fun in there. Bill Algio, even though he's a veteran of the UFC game, the MMA game, he needs to keep his hands up. He ate some clean right hands from Andre Feely, and he was lucky that his chin held up. When he's defending himself, Algio's hands would actually sit kind of below his chest line, and that's just not a good way to defend yourself. If if something goes up high to your head, you have a far way to move your arms or your hands to defend those shots. Now, fighting with your hands low does give you some unique angles for striking, but when you're getting pieced up, you need to do something defensively to protect your head. Both fighters went high and low with kicks. It was very exciting action. Big actions, big contacts, big sounds. It kept the fight exciting for the fans. The long-range weapons were very sharp for both of these fighters. And Andre Feely is more of a speed striker. He's precise, he's fast. And with those low hands of Algio, he was able to take some pretty hard shots. Still very fast, very clean shots from Andre Feely. But I think if Bill Algio faces more of a power striker, He's going to be in a lot of trouble. He had an impressive chin, don't get me wrong, but you don't want to prove you have an impressive chin. If people know you have an impressive chin, that means your defense is not holding up. Andre Feely got a takedown and a deep rear naked choke in round three. And props to Bill Algio. He showed that he also has a ton of heart and battled through it. He then threw punches over his shoulder continually into the face of Andre Feely. Somehow, Bill Algio threw hard shots over his shoulder right onto Feely's face while Feely had his back and was trying to get the choke. Even though Feely had better position, he had the back of Bill Algio on the ground. 
I had to give round three in the decision to Bill Algio. The judges disagreed, but the third round was very tough to judge. And, you know, I wasn't disappointed either way. I think it was fair to give it to Andre Feely, but once he didn't get the rear naked choke, he didn't do much else besides hold on to Bill Algio on the ground. And I just wanted to reward Bill Algio staying busy. I mean, he wasn't getting off from the ground. He was stuck, but he kept throwing. So props to him for that. All action and blood came from Chidi Nojukwani versus Gregory Rodriguez. Right when this fight started, Rodriguez dove for a takedown right into a knee in round one and somehow didn't go to sleep. Very well-timed shot from Chidi. And these guys went at it. Rodriguez was gushing blood early and just an absolute battle between these two warriors. They were both hunting for a finish right away in this fight. It was an incredible fight and the main card just kept building and building towards our main event. Rodriguez landed a big shot that dropped Chidi late in round one as well. This fight was just mayhem. It's a great fight to watch. If you missed it, I would recommend you go back and watch it again. Both fighters had impressive moments in round one. Either guy I thought could win. I thought the finish was coming for sure. I knew this fight wouldn't go to the judges' scorecards as well, but I really liked Gregory Rodriguez, so we did give him the money line bet. And that knee that Rodriguez ate immediately in this fight opened up a massive cut that went super viral on social media, so I'm sure you've probably seen it. But it was basically a cut that went across his nose, almost eye to eye. It went eyebrow to eyebrow easy, but it was a huge gashing cut. Even with that cut, Rodriguez jumped on top with a takedown, and in an incredible comeback, Gregory Rodriguez finished the fight by ground and pound knockout. Unbelievable win. Excellent job by the cut man closing up that cut best he could, and that was just an all-action fun fight for the fans. That led us to our main event, Corey Sandhagen versus Song Yadong. Corey Sandhagen brought a lot of pressure early in this fight and even went for an early takedown which just historically hasn't really been his style. But he spent the past year strictly training his game, so maybe we thought this is maybe a new skill he's worked on. It's worth noting that Sandhagen has been working with jiu-jitsu specialist Ryan Hall and had Ryan Hall's coaches in his corner for this fight. But still, he went for that takedown. We thought, well, that's kind of weird. We haven't seen that from Corey Sandhagen before. But that was a trend that continued for the whole fight. Sandhagen continually went for takedowns, over and over and over and over and over again. Just like we thought from last week's episode, Song Yadong's power was on full display early because he would very patiently keep his defense tight, keep his guard up high, and then unload a powerful strike. Song was very impressive with his grappling. That was an area of his game that we had not quite seen yet, and it was just an incredibly close first round. He was stuffing all the takedowns that came his way from Corey Sandhagen. Song's power continued into the second round, and he stumbled Sandhagen with a strong punch. Sandhagen had his moment to shine in that round too, though. He landed a clean lead elbow to open a cut above Song's eye that literally split his eyebrow apart. That was the most impactful strike of the fight, and it impacted the remainder of this fight. It severely impaired the vision of Song Yadong. And Corey Sandhagen, being one of the more intelligent fighters in MMA in the UFC, made sure to mostly focus his movement towards the cut side of Song to hide his strikes because the blood was just going down into Song's left eye. He used the cut, he used the blood to his advantage, which is just an incredibly high intellect move by a very smart MMA fighter. Somehow, the doctors cleared Song between rounds two and three to continue. As DC said, This physician just loved to watch fights. He did not stop anything. He was down with the blood, down with the cuts, and he said, let's let these boys keep going at it for a little while. Corey Sandhagen continued to shoot tons and tons and tons of takedowns, and although he didn't really complete any of them, they were still very effective because Song Yadong was starting to react to every takedown feint, and it opened up striking. Corey Sandhagen is such an intelligent MMA fighter. Even though the takedowns weren't working, he knew, I have to keep going for these takedowns, I'm getting reactions from Song, and he'll continue to open up my striking. In the fourth round, Song Yadong caught a kick, swept the leg for a takedown to get into top position fairly easily, but by this point in the fight, guys, there was just blood everywhere. 
and kind of using the blood from Song's cut, Cory was able to slip his way to the cage and get up fairly easily. Song Yadong is an absolute warrior. His cut was insane. There was blood everywhere. Song never gave up on himself, though, and he still threw with a ton of power in round four, which is very impressive. Finally, between rounds four and five, the doctor had to call it, had to stop this fight, because the cut now started to swell also. Once the stoppage was made, I thought it was an excellent stoppage. He gave Song a few more rounds to try to get the win, but at some point, the damage was getting so severe, the fight needed to end. And Song actually went over to Sandhagen and said that he couldn't see once that fight was stopped. In my opinion, both fighters won in a way because Song Yudong showed that he's a very serious fighter in this division. And Corey Sandhagen got back on the winning streak, back to his winning ways. And he's at the elite at the top of the division, so good win for Sandhagen as well. That wraps up our rapid recap. Let's take a look at our bets. Look, like I said, guys, it was a historic night for me in the worst way possible. Never have I ever had such a poor gambling night in my life. It was so bad that it was impressive. It was funny. It's honestly hard to do, but somehow I found a way to lose my first seven bets. You could argue probably harder than going 7-0 and on your bets. I found a way to somehow go 0-7. I couldn't stumble my way to a victory during those prelims. The entire prelims, by the way, we didn't win a single bet on those prelims. It was crazy. It was one of the most amazingly bad things that's ever happened in my professional gambling career. But hey, that is why you gamble within your means and you go into it knowing that the house always wins. But, you know, for the flip side, positive spin, we can only do better next time. So we'll focus on bouncing back and our next opportunity. And let's go ahead and review those bets. UFC prelims, Nicholas Mota versus Cameron Van Camp. We had Cameron Van Camp money line plus 180 loss. Tony Gravely versus Javid Basharat. Tony Gravely money line plus 135 loss. Maria Agapova versus Jillian Robertson. Agapova money line plus 125 as a homestyle gravy bet loss. Trey Ogden versus Daniel Zellhuber. Fight to not go the distance. Minus 125. Homestyle gravy bet. Going back for more bet. Didn't matter. Loss bet. <laughs> Numa look boon me versus Denise Gomez. We had Gomez money line plus 195 for a loss. Trevin Giles versus Luis Koch. Fight to not go the distance. Minus 190 loss. And finally, Damon Jackson versus Pat Sabatini. Fight to go the distance. Minus 215. Also a loss. Whew. That wraps up our prelims. Let's talk about the UFC main card bets where we were able to salvage the night just a little bit. Still a bad night, but we saved just a little bit with the main card. Anthony Hernandez versus Mark Andre Baralt. Anthony Hernandez money line minus 175 for a homestyle gravy bet was a win. Tanner Bozier versus Rodrigo Nascimento fight to not go the distance minus 250 homestyle gravy bet loss. That was a shocker for me. Joe Pfeiffer versus Alan Amadovsky fight to not go the distance homestyle gravy bet going back for more bet minus 350 win. Andre Feely versus Bill Algio fight to go the distance minus 215 win. Chidi Nijakwani versus Gregory Rodriguez. Rodriguez Moneyline plus 104 underdog win. And Corey Sandhagen versus Song Yadong. Corey Sandhagen minus 190 win. So all in all for the UFC, we were down 5.82 units on that Saturday. And we went 5-8. and eight, Which is probably the worst record I could think of off the top of my head that I've had in the UFC in quite some time. Our home saw gravy bets as a reminder. Those are our top 5 favorite bets of the weekend. They were 2-3 and three with 5 total bets. Definitely the worst record we've had worth our homestyle gravy bets before. And are going back for more bets, which are 2-unit bets as opposed to all of our other 1-unit bets. Went 1 for 2. Thankfully, the main card was not terrible. There were a ton of fighters who recently fought on Dana White's Contender Series on this card. And I think for me, not being able to know that much about the fighters' history really worked against me. I do my best when I can look at historic fights go into the detail, see why they won, why they lost, analyze who I think could win based on their styles of the fighter. And funny enough, a lot of what I thought could happen did happen. Go back and listen to episode 18. Many of these fights I said, like I said earlier, I said, look, fighter A wins if this happens in the fight, and fighter B wins if this happens in the fight. Then I would go, all right, we're going to go with fighter B, 
fighter A would win how I said he could win, and, you know, that's what happens sometimes in the gambling world. We move forward. The home style perfect plate parlay, Daniel Zellhuber, Anthony Hernandez, and Joe Pye for all to win was plus 161. We lost with the very poor performance from Daniel Zellhuber on Saturday. That wraps up our bets. Let's take a look at Verdict and the Homestyle MMA Podcast Awards. Very fortunate for us, bad prelims does not equate to a bad day on Verdict. Verdict sticks mostly to the main card, so we did pretty well on Verdict and earned ourselves a silver medal for being in the top 40% of predictions. Out of the six main card fights, we had five winners correct, one method of victory, and two rounds correct. We pretty evenly distributed our experience points across all fights, and we got the silver medal. I'll take it for sure. That takes us to our Homestyle MMA Podcast Awards. There were no early prelims, so we start with the mac and cheese UFC prelims performance of the night. That is going to Jillian Robertson. She was beat up bad with some of the strikes against Maria Agapova in her fight. Battled through it, battled back. Eventually forced this fight to the ground, which is where she wanted it to take place. And she just controlled it and won it from there with a submission. Excellent performance and bounce back from her. And that same thought process is why we awarded our Chicken and Dumplings UFC main card performance of the night to Gregory Rodriguez. He faced some of the bloodiest and worst adversity I'd seen in a fight in quite some time with his head just busted open immediately to start his fight. He never gave up, continued to fight hard and came back and won that fight in round two. Two, I think, very well-deserving winners of awards this week. And finally, we can leave UFC Fight Night Sanhagen vs. Song in the past in our memory. Let's think towards the future. We're going to do some matchmaking in our new matchmaking segment, Part 1, The Lighter Fighters. We're going to start small and work our way up. So we're starting with the women's strawweight division. We have champion Carla Esparza versus number two ranked Zhang Weili already set for UFC 281. Number five Mackenzie Dern versus number six Yan Zhao Nan scheduled for UFC Fight Night main event October 1st. So with all of that in mind, I think what we need to do is set up number one ranked Rose Nama Yunus, who lost the belt in her last fight against the current champ, against the winner of Dern versus Jan, and number three ranked Marina Rodriguez, who's on a four-fight win streak, against number four ranked Jessica Andraj. Ideally, I think you try to make that fight as soon as you possibly can so that the winner of Marina Rodriguez and Jessica Andraj fights for the title next in line after that. I also don't hate matching Rose Namajunas against Marina Rodriguez for next in line for the championship and just give the winner of Dern versus Jan to Jessica Andraj if Jessica Andraj wants to fight in flyweight in the meantime because she does fight in multiple weight classes. She's highly ranked in both so we have some flexibility. Really she has the flexibility to decide which weight class she wants to fight in next when you're ranked that highly in two different divisions. So that'll take us to our women's flyweights. We have number one ranked Caitlin Chukagian currently on a four fight win streak fighting number seven, Menin Fioro, who's 4-0 in the UFC at UFC 280. This is a tough division for me because while it may not be fair, I would give Kaitlyn Chugagian to the champion Valentina Shevchenko if she wins that fight and unfortunately probably make Menin Fioro win once more before fighting for a title if she wins that fight because the division is so loaded. Number two ranked Talia Santos lost to Shevchenko in her last fight. And number three ranked Lauren Murphy won her last fight after also losing to the champ before that. I think you can pair both of them up for next in line. Like I said, Jessica Andrade is tough to match make because she is highly ranked in both divisions. I think if you want, you could put number four ranked Jessica Andrade against number five Alexa Grasso, who's on a three fight win streak. If Andrade wants to fight at straw weight first, then I think if Man and Fioro wins against Chukagian coming up in a few weeks, I would match up Fioro against number five ranked Alexa Grasso instead. So a lot of movement, a lot of different things you can do. If you want to follow along, go to the UFC website and look up the rankings so you can keep track of these fighters' names. 
all I'm doing is matchmaking some of the top fighters in each division. For men's flyweights, we have number one ranked Brandon Moreno currently holding an interim championship belt. So I think obviously the first thing we need to do is go for a fourth fight with current champion Divas and Figueiredo to unify the division. Ideally, I want that fight soon because it's not set yet and because I think Alexandre Pantoja deserves a title shot right now. A lot of the elite fighters in this division already fought each other as well, so it's confusing, a little bit hard to make matchmaking because they've already all fought before, and ideally I'd want rematches in the championship, but Brandon Moreno and Divas and Figueroa have fought each other so much we just kind of have a log jam. So what we need to do is the moreno Figueroa fight for their fourth fight in early 2023, and then I would love to do Alexandre Pantoja, who's on a three-fight win streak, against number three, Kaikara France, who just lost the interim title fight his last time out against Brandon Moreno, on that same card. That way, we know who will be next after Moreno versus Divas and Figueiredo for the champion. It'll be the winner of Pantoja and Kaikara France. Then later in the year, we could have number four ranked Askar Askarov fight number five ranked Brandon Roy Vall for potentially next in line after that. Because I do think that if Divas and Figueiredo loses to Moreno or loses to the winner of Pantoja versus Kaikara France, we could move him up a weight class if he loses the belt and kind of clear out a spot for someone new to take a shot at the title because Figueiredo is a really big flyweight. Sometimes he kind of struggles with weight. With women's bantamweight, I'm actually not that interested myself in another immediate rematch of the champion Amanda Nunez versus number one ranked Juliana Pena. I would like to see the champ Amanda Nunez against number two ranked Ketlin Vieira, who's on a two fight win streak and just beat number three Holly Holm, who's a legend in the UFC Bantamweight division, former champion. I think you match up number one ranked Juliana Pena, who just lost the championship belt after briefly taking it from Amanda Nunez with number four ranked Irene Aldana, who's on a two-fight knockout win streak. Then you do, again, number three ranked Holly Holm against number five ranked Raquel Pennington, who's also on a four-fight win streak and last lost to Holly Holm in 2020 for a chance of redemption. You could put the Pena-Aldana and Holm-Pennington fights maybe on the same night and have the most impressive winner get next in line for a title shot. A lot of elite fighters at the top of the women's band and weight division. But none of these fights are scheduled. Let's go ahead and start getting some stuff on the books. In the men's bantamweight division, we have champion Aljamain Sterling defending his belt against number two ranked TJ Dillashaw at UFC 280, scheduled along with number one ranked Peter Yan versus number 13 ranked Sean O'Malley on that same card. Shout out real quick to the legend Jose Aldo for retiring from MMA earlier this week. He was an absolute legend of the sport, a top ranked bantamweight, a former champion in the UFC. So shout out to him. Congratulations on your retirement. I hope you enjoy some time away. Okay, so UFC 280. I think if Peter Yan wins, I think he obviously faces the winner of Sterling versus Dillashaw. And number four ranked Corey Sandhagen, who just fought this past Saturday, is just in a weird spot for me because he's faced and lost to Sterling, Dillashaw, and Yan in the past already. He's fighting around when all three of them are all fighting from a timeline standpoint though so i think you could put him in a rematch next because it is convenient from that timeline standpoint i think sandhagen should face the loser of the championship fight between aljo and dillashaw towards the start of the next year if yawn wins so aljo dillashaw fight if yawn beats o'malley he gets next and the loser of aljo and dillashaw should face sandhagen at the start of next year in the meantime, I think you can go ahead and match up number three ranked Marab Dvalishvili with number five ranked Marlon Vera before the end of the year. With the winner of that fight maybe getting next after Peter Yan if he wins his fight. Maybe if Yan loses, the winner of Dvalishvili and Vera can jump to next in line. You can see how Corey Sanhagen's just kind of in a tough spot regardless of how we look at it. With the women's featherweight division, this is just a weird division because there's no rankings. If you did what I said with the UFC website, you checked out the rankings. There's no clear challengers in this division for Amanda Nunes. And frankly, I don't think anyone in the UFC can beat Amanda at 145. 
a lot of the people in the UFC who could fight at 145 are there because they fight at 135 in the bantamweight division. Amanda, I believe, is more of a 145-pound fighter who can cut down to 135. I think a lot of the 135ers in the UFC are true 135-pound fighters. So they're cutting, they're still cutting to 135, but I'm saying that I think Amanda even cuts a little bit to get to 145. Don't know if that's true or not, but I just don't see anyone beating Amanda in the featherweight division. With no official rankings with the UFC in this weight class, I think you could match up Macy Chiazon with Stephanie Egger and Norma Dumont with Josiane Nunes and just kind of see if someone can separate themselves in those fights. If no one really separates themselves in those fights, then I would even take it a step further and match up the winners of each of those and then give that winner the next shot so that they're at least on a pretty good little win streak. Josiane Nunez is new to the UFC at 2-0, but won her last fight at featherweight. Chazon lost her last fight, but that was at bantamweight, and she beat Norma Dumont at featherweight before that. Dumont just won in featherweight her last time out, and Stephanie Egger won her last fight at featherweight as well, her last time out also. So basically, we have a bunch of people maybe on one or two fight win streaks in the featherweight division. Maybe we build up to a three or four fight win streak for one of these four women to then fight Amanda Nunes. It's the only thing that I can really see that the UFC could do, but I also don't think any of those four names beat the champion Amanda Nunes at 145. Now let's talk men's featherweight division. I love this division. It is stacked. So many elite fighters with many fights to be made. The UFC is working on number five ranked Calvin Cater versus number six ranked Arnold Allen. I think that's just about locked in at this point. I think the UFC needs to quickly book number one Max Holloway versus number four Josh Emmett for the first challenger to champion Alexander Volkanovsky. Some people aren't going to like that. Josh Emmett's going to hate it. He thinks he deserves next right now, but it's hard because then what do you do with Max? I don't know what you do with Max Holloway. The dude is still so good. He's talking about going up a division, and I just hope he really stays at featherweight. He is the 1B to Alexander Volkanovsky's 1A. Max Holloway's so good at featherweight. If he goes up to 155, I just think he's going to be too small. So keep him in the relevant in the featherweight division. Put him with number four Josh Emmett for a title eliminator fight. And frankly... I think the fans are fine with watching Max Holloway continue to fight Volkanovski. It's kind of similar to Figueredo versus Moreno. When you are the best two guys in the division, I don't care how many times you fought in the past and how the records went. You keep putting the best guys together in the fight. Fans will keep enjoying those fights. I think you put the winner of Calvin Cater versus Arnold Allen matched up with number three, Brian Ortega. Ortega's recovering from an injury, so timeline-wise that could work out. And then finally, I would match up number two ranked Yair Rodriguez with the loser of Holloway Emmett, even though his last loss was against Max Holloway in 2021. So he's in a weird spot too. I don't know. Everyone's really good in the featherweight division at the top, but they've all kind of fought each other also, so it's just a weird spot. When a champion reigns supreme over a division for several years and fights one person three times over that span like Alex Volkanovsky has, you're just going to get rematches to build someone up to that title fight. I think all the fights in the top six are very competitive, and it's just about someone separating from the pack and demanding the title shot. Like I said, it's a very similar situation for what we're going through in the UFC flyweight division. You got two guys who are, who had been at least, much higher on a different level than the rest of the division, and they've just been fighting each other for the title. It creates a weird logjam at the top where everyone's fighting each other, possibly for the second time. But hey, I think the UFC needs to stick to the model of the best fighters get the title shots. And I think fans will continue to be happy if that happens. That wraps up this shorter episode of the podcast. Let's go into our wrap up. As always, please bet responsibly. If you have a gambling problem, call your state's hotline. Please go follow at the Homestyle MMA Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Homestyle MMA Pod on Twitter. 
check out www.thehomestylemmapodcast.podbean.com for additional information about the podcast. We're going to continue to grow on social media. Like I've been saying, we're actually getting a lot of really great interaction on social media. We recently got a follow from a verified fighter on Twitter. So go ahead and check out our social media pages. Feel free to engage. Let's have a good time. And I appreciate you listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe, like, comment, and review. Next week, we'll be doing another little bit shorter podcast like this one, previewing UFC Fight Night Dern versus Jan. And we're also going to be covering matchmaking for the rest of the UFC divisions. Till next time, this was Sean Van Buren on the Homestyle MMA Podcast. Have a good one.